There are a number of places on our planet that are very hard for most people to get to, like much of the ocean. There's just a lot of it. And for a big chunk of human history, it has been a pretty hostile environment. And the North Pole. It is famously cold, dark, and if you don't know what you're doing, deadly. And putting those two places together gets you the Arctic Ocean, a double whammy of general inaccessibility, which kind of makes it the perfect habitat for unicorns. Unicorns of the sea, that is. The Bizarre Beast Pin Club is open for subscriptions for the whole month. Sign up by January 20th and the first pin you get will be a unicorn of the sea. The narwhal puts a curious spin on what it means to be classified as a toothed whale. Their scientific name, Monodon monoceros, means one tooth, one horn, which refers to, well, their whole deal. It's the same reason that one of the Inuit names for them is Kilalugak Garnertak, meaning the one who points to the sky. The name narwhal, meanwhile, comes from the Old Norse for corpse whale due to the adult's splotchy gray color, and possibly also their habit of bobbing motionless just below the surface. Along with the beluga, they're one of only two living members of the Arctic whale family Monodontidae. And you can recognize members of this family by a couple of key features. These include unfused neck vertebrae for greater flexibility, no dorsal fin, which might be an adaptation for maneuvering under the ice, along with a big melon on their forehead. This weird organ is involved in vocalization and echolocation. And the narwhal itself is characterized by more than just its very special tooth. For example, compared to their ghostly beluga cousins, narwhals are pretty dark in color, though this changes over time. Young narwhals start out entirely gray, but as they get older, they develop more and more pale patches on their skin. The oldest, sometimes living up to 50 years, may end up almost entirely white. Adult narwhals are four to five meters long and up to 1,600 kilograms, with males typically being the larger sex and the ones most likely to grow a tusk. Males and females also differ in tail fluke shape, which for males may be compensation for the increased drag created by that tusk. But for females, this fluke shape difference means being able to make deeper dives, and narwhals can dive deep. Inuit hunters find squid, cod, halibut, and shrimp in their stomachs, many of which may live 1,200 meters down or more. Narwhals have even been recorded diving to at least 1,500 meters. And they have no teeth, so they just slurp down their deep sea prey. No teeth, that is, except for the canines in their upper jaw. Both males and females have two canines that grow directly forward as tusks. For females, these usually stay embedded in the bone, while the male's left canine grows out in a long counterclockwise spiral straight through its face. This one twisty tooth can grow up to three meters long, and it's always the canine on the left, except in rare cases when it's both the left and right, which happens in about 1.5% of narwhals, like some kind of horrible facial barbecue fork. That spiral shape keeps the tusk growing in a nice straight line, which prevents it from interfering too badly with swimming. And when we say that the tusk comes straight out of its face, we mean that very literally. The tooth pierces directly through the whale's upper lip, creating a wound that never fully heals. This in turn makes a great home for parasites acidic crustaceans called whale lice, which like to eat dead skin. The tusk itself is a highly sensitive structure full of nerve endings and blood vessels for almost the whole length, with a tip that's for some reason always polished smooth. It's incredibly flexible too. It can bend up to 12 degrees in all directions, which came as a recent surprise to scientists but was already well known to Inuit whalers. Basically, the tusk is a giant inside-out bendy tooth that feels everything and almost exclusively grows in males. So just what is this thing for anyway? Turns out answering this question has been a centuries long challenge, at least for Europeans. Which brings us back to unicorns. Mentions of mythical horned horses go back at least as far as ancient Rome, and the market for their supposed horns as a miracle cure-all got into full swing sometime between the Iron Age and the Middle Ages. A steady supply of these magical trophies came from Scandinavian dealers, who in turn were probably only introduced to narwhals in the first place by their Inuit neighbors. Eventually, a 17th century Danish naturalist figured out the real-world 
source for so many unicorn horns, which left him instead with the incomprehensible tooth of a weird whale. So for the next four centuries, scientists would try to find out what that was all about, with explanations ranging from a swimming rudder to an iceberg resting post. One 1800s proposal was that narwhals used their tusks for spearing their prey, though there had never been any actual evidence of this. It's also unclear how, after a successful spearing, the narwhal would actually reach their fish kebab. Another hypothesis from the early 1900s was that the tusk was actually used for digging around on the seafloor for prey, which was potentially supported by the discovery of broken tips being plugged with sand. But other researchers pointed out that this damage was more likely just an incidental result of normal hunting behavior near the bottom of the ocean. And from the 1800s all the way to the mid-1900s, a prevailing theory was that the tusk was used for stabbing air holes out of the sea ice. Inuit observations confirmed that although this can maybe happen in rare emergencies when a narwhal gets trapped, they usually avoid deliberately putting their tusks at risk. They typically don't stab through thin ice so much as bonk through. Technological advances later made it possible to record narwhal echolocation. Leading scientists in the 1970s proposed that the tusk might help direct sound waves. We've since learned that they do have the most targeted biological sonar known to science, but the tusk doesn't seem to really be a part of that. Plus, again, it's mainly male narwhals that have tusks, and the females gotta eat too. For this reason, sexual selection as a driver of tusk growth has been a popular theory for many years, since it would better explain why the tusk is such a sexually dimorphic trait. But whether this looks like straight up jousting to compete for mates, or just a non-violent display for establishing dominance, has been hard to actually witness in the wild. Scientists have pointed to scars on males' heads and broken tusk tips as signs of male-on-male -male fighting, but Inuit experts suggest that these injuries are more likely the result of near misses with orcas or even humans. And modern research has found a correlation between tusk size and testicle size, supporting the theory of tusks being used for display purposes as an honest indicator of fertility. But strangely and importantly, tusks also occur in about 15% of females, so sexual selection alone isn't enough to solve the tusk mystery. And remember how we said the tusk is basically an inside-out tooth? Well. Scientists have recently found that there are millions of tiny, direct channels from the nerve at the center of the tusk all the way to the seawater on the outside. This allows the whales to sense ambient changes in temperature, salinity, and maybe more, which could help with things like navigation and detecting whether the ocean is about to freeze over. So where does this all actually leave us today? For lack of a better way to put it, everybody was right. Well, not the fish stabbing hypothesis, but everybody else. Like, additional evidence for sexual selection has been found in the last few years, and drone footage has captured narwhals hunting with their tusks by slapping fish to stun them. And the wear on the tusk tips really does seem to come from rubbing on sand or ice. And further drone research from just last year has even shown narwhals using their tusks to play with fish. Just kind of hassling them without eating them. But all these examples of how narwhals use their tusks still don't tell us why they have them in the first place. For that, we have to go all the way back, past their natural history and into their evolutionary history. The family Monodon today, along with dolphins and porpoises, split off from other toothed whales around 11 million years ago. Belugas and narwhals share their last known common ancestor around 6 million years ago. And somewhere in all that time, narwhals seemingly lost almost all their teeth and then got real weird with the one that was left. But even though belugas still have teeth, they mostly use suction to swallow prey whole, just like narwhals. And beluga males often have larger teeth than females. In fact, tooth size is a sexually dimorphic trait shared by lots of toothed whales. In other words, narwhal ancestors probably had no trouble eating, regardless of what their teeth looked like, and males very easily may have already had bigger teeth than females. So a chance mutation leading to something more tusk-like wouldn't have been a deal-breaker for survival. Just ask the strap-toothed whale on the opposite side of the globe, whose mature 
parrot's husks actually prevent their mouths from even opening all the way. My point is, there's a precedent for odd but showy teeth to become popular with female whales, and sexual selection is indeed currently the best guess for why narwhal tusks at least started. As for all that other stuff that the tusks can do now? Well, those might be exaptations, when a naturally selected specialization, for one thing, takes on a different function over time. So a tusk that started out as simple eye candy could have later evolved into an amazing multi-tool. Heck, some of those new uses may have even added to the sexual selection feedback loop. Chemical detection in the water could help males find females to mate with, or food for offspring. And maybe useful exaptations could even explain the occasional appearance of tusks in female narwhals. More practical functions need more fitness incentive to pass that trait down to more than one sex. But then again, female tusks aren't as sensitive as male tusks, and really there's just too much we don't know to draw any bigger conclusions. But we've at least come a long way since the unicorn days. Figuring out narwhals has been quite the scientific journey. It goes to show how Western methods can help put some pieces of the puzzle together, but also how, at the end of the day, nothing beats direct observation. Increasing Increasingly sophisticated technology and techniques have gone a long way towards helping us understand the narwhal's mysterious face corkscrew, but we couldn't have managed a fraction of it without also leaning on Inuit ways of knowing. Beasts like the narwhal can be bizarre both by defying easy explanation and by eluding mainstream scientific study. But with the knowledge and help of locals, we're getting there. For now though, these unicorns of the sea still get to hold on to some of that mythical status. Sign up for the pen club at bizarrebeastshow.com and help us keep this channel going. If you want a narwhal to be your first pin, sign up by January 20th. And now for some bonus facts. In March of 1990, a mysterious skull was found on the roof of a tool shed in West Greenland. The Inuit hunter who had put it there three or four years prior said that the whale he had caught looked like a combination of a narwhal and a beluga. The skull was bigger than those of either species, but was long like a narwhal skull. The teeth, on the other hand, were something else. They all pointed forward. Some of them were embedded in the jaw, while some would have erupted through the gums. And there were even two large embedded tusk-like teeth in the upper jaw. And a few of the teeth in the lower jaw twisted a little and had grooves. The hunter said that he saw two other weird whales around the same time, but couldn't recover their remains. So from his account and the skull specimen, the legend of the narluga began. Narwhals and belugas are, to be sure, totally different genera, let alone species, but they're in the same family and hybrids of that level of relatedness are possible sometimes. Most hybridists cases like these occur in captivity, but in the wild, a blue whale and a fin whale have evidently bred on at least one occasion, and various dolphin hybrids have also been recorded. So for the next quarter century, scientists speculated about the feasibility of a narluga, and whether the skull actually belonged to such a hybrid. And if not, then what was it? Thanks to genomic DNA comparisons, researchers have now finally determined after all of these years that, yeah, no, it was totally just a narluga the whole time. Specifically, the male offspring of a male beluga and a female narwhal. And when you compare the skulls of a beluga, this guy, and a narwhal, you can much more clearly see the middle ground that he covers. How often hybrids like the narluga actually occur in nature is unclear, but boatloads of genetic data ultimately confirm what the hunter had said in the first place. Place.